We're not going to switch our focus. We're going to talk about the chemical laws and some chemical theories and how they affect our lives. And we're going to start by talking about what's the difference between a law and a theory. So in this unit, we're going to talk about the, the chemical laws and theories that are related to matter and energy because that is the focus of this chemistry and this unit. So we're going to start with scientific law versus scientific theory. A scientific law is a statement of what always occurs under certain conditions. It is a description of a relationship or a sequence of phenomena that is invariable under the same conditions. While the scientific theory is an explanation or a model based on observation, experimentation, reasoning, especially one that has been tested and confirmed as a general principle helping to explain and predict natural phenomena. So what do we mean by those two phrases? Let's start with scientific law. What scientific laws do you know? Well, most people know the law of gravity. So what is the law of gravity? What does it do? When we talk about the law of gravity, it says, essentially, what goes up must come down. Is that always true? Well, not always, because we can shoot a rocket out into space. If we shoot that rocket into space, is it still following the law of gravity? It is. But when we talk about the law of gravity saying what goes up must come down, we have to make the exception, and that is, unless something reaches escape velocity, then it doesn't come back down to Earth. It may come down to somewhere else, but it won't necessarily come back down to Earth. So we have these rules that say, under these conditions, if I throw a ball into the air, and as long as I'm not throwing it faster than escape velocity, then it will come back down. What happens if it gets caught in a tree? Well, it did come down, but it got caught in a tree. So we do see that there are some exceptions. We have certain conditions. As long as it doesn't get stuck behind something, it will come back down. Did I explain anything about why gravity works the way it does? Not at all. The scientific law doesn't explain what happens. It's just going to say, if I do this, this will happen. And that's what we always see whenever we're under those same conditions. Can laws be changed? Of course. And that's why when originally when we said what goes up must come down, we said, yeah, that's always true for the scientific law of gravity. But if I reach escape velocity, that rule changes to something else. So these laws can be redefined a little bit because we need to know what conditions are important. But otherwise, scientific laws are pretty standard. If this happens, then this happens. If this happens, then that happens. And how is that different from a scientific theory? What are some theories that you know? Well, most people know the theory of evolution. We'll take that for an example. Um, in the theory of evolution, what does it tell you? This is super generalized, but here it starts off with, at one point there was just a single cell, then it became a multicellular um, creature, and then that became eventually a fish. Fish came out of water, we became... Uh, amphibians, reptiles, and eventually mammals, and then monkeys came out of that at some point, and then out of that came humans. So basically we've had this change, evolutionary change, of creatures. So what does the theory of evolution say? It just says that we're changing over time, right? The species are being developed and grown over time. Is the theory of evolution correct? Who knows? We don't know for sure. It is just an explanation that tells us what we think happened from what we've seen. Does it predict what's going to happen next? No. Scientific laws predict what will happen next. Scientific theories don't. Just because we can now hear things with Bluetooth doesn't mean that we're going to end up with Bluetooth in our, ear, in our ears so that we can hear things from our computers. Do theories change? Absolutely. So we can see that uh, there was at one time a theory that the world was flat. Most of us don't believe that now, although there are people out there that do, and you can find that on the Flat World Society websites. But we kind of figured out that it wasn't flat because nobody ever fell off the edge of the earth, and we were able to circumnavigate the earth. When new evidence was found, we were able to circumnavigate the earth, that was new evidence that gave us a new theory that, hey, the Earth is round. Well, is the Earth round? If you were to go into outer space and make measurements on the Earth, you would look out down at it and you would see that it is not spherical, round. We would see that it is 
a little bit of a flattened ball so that we can see that it's wider at the equator and a little bit more shallow at the top, so it's not quite a sphere. And again, that changes our theory. And now let's try seeing if we can decide if something is a statement, is an observation, a law, or a theory. Okay, so let's try it. Indicate whether each of the following is an example of an observation, a law, or a theory. Pause your video, and when you come back, I'll give you the answers. All right, let's start with number one. My cat is purring. That would be an observation. My cat purrs when I scratch her head. That would be a law. Anytime I scratch my cat's head, gently, she will purr. Next, we have cats like to be petted, so they purr. That's my theory. I believe she likes to be petted. Number four, if I don't water the grass, it turns brown. That would be a law. If I don't ever water the grass, it will turn brown. Orange juice is orange. That's an observation. The sky is blue because light is scattered, but the blue light is scattered less. Hmm, that sounds like a theory. I believe that is why it's happening. Number seven, there are dirty dishes in my sink. That's an observation. Number eight, eating food creates dirty dishes. That's a theory. Probably not a correct theory, but a theory. For example, if I eat an apple, that doesn't create dishes. So not all eating of food creates dirty dishes, but it is a theory, so we're going to mark it as a theory. And number nine, when I use a dish and then place it in the sink, my sink will have dirty dishes until I remove them. That is a law. Of course, that law may change. It may end up that my kids finally learn how to do dishes, and then it won't be until I remove them, but it'll be until somebody removes them. At any rate, that would be considered a law. There are three chemical laws that we'll be expecting you to remember and be able to identify in this exam. They are the law of definite composition, the law of conservation of mass or matter, and the law of conservation of energy. Let's look at each of those individually. So first we have the law of definite composition. And it states that in a specific chemical compound, the elements are present in a fixed percentage by weight. What does that mean? A simple way to think of this is the fact that every chemical has a specific formula. For example, we know water has the formula H2O. And that formula will be the same whether I'm in Egypt, here in America, on the moon, at Mars, the formula for water will always be H2O. The reason that the law states that it has to have a fixed percentage by weight is because we can calculate what the weight would be of the hydrogen and the oxygen because again we know that those that there are two hydrogens and one oxygen and we know the atomic masses of hydrogen and oxygen. So I'm going to show you mathematically what I mean. You do not have to do this math. We know that there are two hydrogens and that each hydrogen atom weighs one AMU for a total of two AMU. There's one oxygen atom and it weighs 16 AMU so that our total is 18 AMU. To find the percentage of hydrogen, we'll take the two AMU for hydrogen, divide that by 18 AMU total, multiply by 100% to make it a percent, and we'll find that it is 11 0.11% hydrogen. We could do the same thing for oxygen. We would see that we have 16 AMU divided by 18 AMU total times 100% and you get 88.89% oxygen. So this is the ratio of hydrogen to oxygen that we find in water throughout our world and any other world. Are there other ways that hydrogen and oxygen can come together? Well, they could be, we could have H2O2, which is called hydrogen peroxide. If we were looking at the definite composition of hydrogen peroxide and we wanted to find the percentages, we would see that in this formula we have two hydrogens for 2 AMU and two oxygens for 32 AMU, which means we have a total of 34 AMU. And to find the percentage of hydrogen, we would take 2 AMU divided by 34 AMU total multiply by 100% and we would find that we have 6% hydrogen. So what is the percentage of oxygen? Again, you do not need to do these calculations. 
We take the 32 AMU of oxygen, divide that by the 34 AMU total, and you should find that you have 94% oxygen. So as you can see, each chemical, they each had hydrogen and oxygen, but the percentage was different, and that made it a different chemical. So I have to tell you a little chemistry joke here. Two guys walk into a bar. One sits down and says, hey, bartender, I'd like some H2O. And the guy next to him says, I'd like some H2O too. And he dies. And in case you're not sure why, H2O2, again, is hydrogen peroxide, and that would kill you if you drank it. Now let's look at the law of conservation of matter, or mass. In a chemical change, matter is neither created nor destroyed. Therefore, its mass is conserved. Before we move on with this, I'd like to ask you a quick question. A mature maple tree can have a mass of one ton or more. That's its dry biomass after removing all the water. Yet, it starts from a seed that weighs less than one gram. Which of the following processes contributes the most to this huge increase in biomass? A. The absorption of mineral substances from the soil via the roots. B. The absorption of organic substances from the soil via the roots. C. The incorporation of CO2 gas from the atmosphere into the molecules by the green leaves. D. The incorporation of water from the soil into the molecules by green leaves or E, absorption of solar radiation into the leaf. This question was asked of some college seniors as they were preparing to graduate. Almost half of them got it wrong. How did you do? Well, several of these do add mass to the tree. Once we take away the water, that certainly won't be a part of it, so letter D cannot be correct. But we see that the vast majority of the mass of the tree comes from the incorporation of carbon dioxide gas from the atmosphere into the molecules by the green leaves. And this is through the process known as photosynthesis. So what does this question have to do with the law of conservation of matter? This law states that we can't just make matter out of nothing. There has to be matter that is changed from one form to another, and that goes through a chemical reaction. This example shows us that we may not always see where that source of matter is. In this case, we can't see the CO2 converted to sugar by the plants through photosynthesis. Oftentimes we forget that the air has something, it's made up of something. In this case, we're using the CO2 from the air and we're using it through the process of photosynthesis to turn it into a sugar inside of the plant which eventually turns it into a polysaccharide, which we'll talk about later, and that makes up most of the matter that we find in the tree. Now let me ask a slightly different question. When I take a 10 kilogram piece of wood and I burn it, will the ashes weigh 10 kilograms? No, they don't. Why? Why is it so much lighter? In this case, we're burning the cellulose that was made by photosynthesis and it's giving off heat and light energy, and more importantly, CO2 and water are going back in the gaseous phase, so we don't see them, but they are being released, so that we're making that same amount of matter will be present. We just won't weigh it in the ashes, but it will still be present in our surroundings. The way that the law of conservation of mass is most often used, though, is in using balanced equations. So in chemistry, we often like to write what we start with, our reactants, and what's made, our products, and we see that overall, the total number of atoms we have on the reactant side and the total number of those same atoms on the product side have to match. So if I have five hydrogens on the reactant side, I have to have five hydrogens on the product side. If I have 20 oxygens on the reactant side, I have to have 20 oxygens on the product side. They may be attached in different ways, but overall the number has to be the same. And that's because of the law of conservation of matter. Whatever I have on the starting side, the reactant side, I have to have on the product side. And this allows us to predict what the products will be because those elements and how many there are have to stay the same overall. And finally, we're going to have the law of conservation of energy, which is very closely related. So this law, the law of conservation of energy, 
states that in any ordinary chemical change, energy is neither created nor destroyed. What that sounds like is that I don't have to worry about saving energy. We always hear about we need to save energy in all kinds of different ads. Well, why does it matter if it can't be created or destroyed? What is different is how it's being stored. So when we have energy in the form of a battery, that's pretty useful to us. We can use a battery. On the other hand, when it's a hot day outside and the, there's warm air all around you, it's a little bit harder to use that energy. And so we can lose the energy of a battery into heating up the air and that sort of thing. So what's normally considered the conservation of energy is normally just saying trying to keep the energy in a useful form rather than in an unuseful form. But according to the chemist, all of that energy is conserved. It's just changed its form. What are some of the different types of forms of energy that you know about? Most people know about fossil fuels that run our cars. There's, those are a type of stored energy. There's geothermal energy. There's solar energy. There's wind energy. There's sound energy electrical energy, rotational energy, there's all sorts of different types of energy. So what we do know is that we're changing from one type to another, and when we do that, we don't make any new energy and we don't destroy it. Almost all of the energy on Earth comes from one source, though, and that source is the sun. So think about the energy from the sun. We get heat and light from the sun. It beams down on the Earth. That heat warms up the air around, causing wind, and ocean currents, because where there's warmer temperatures and colder temperatures, those particles will move from one spot to another. They also create photosynthesis. Now, photosynthesis takes the energy from the sun and makes it so that carbon dioxide is converted into sugar, and just about every living thing uses that sugar as an energy source. What happens when that animal dies? It no longer has energy, right? Well, actually it does. Is now stored up energy, and when the dinosaurs died, we found that that energy turned into what we call now fossil fuels. We see that this energy is always conserved. It's always around. It's just changing form from one thing to another. What about something like a hydroelectric plant? How does it get its energy? Generally speaking, water from the ocean is evaporated by the sun. The energy, the heat energy of the sun, warms up the water, evaporates it, brings it up, goes to a mountain area where it's colder, the water drains down, and then it comes running down a river, and you'll see that it rotates um, a mill, let's say. And so that gives us some rotational energy. It's turned into electrical energy. Maybe it gets stored behind a dam, and then it's released as we need it to create more rotational energy, which is converted to electrical energy, which is sent to your house, via electrical energy and convert it into another form of energy, something like light and sound, so that you can see and hear this video. So previously we talked about this burning fire, and when we saw the fire, we saw there was heat and light given off. But where did that heat and light come from? Was it created? No, it definitely wasn't. It wasn't created, but it was changed. It was changed from the stored energy in the wood we had energy stored in the wood, we gave it a little spark, caught on fire, gave off more of that energy as heat and light. Which one's more useful? The stored energy that we see in the wood is generally more useful to us. And the heat energy is harder for us to capture. It likes to go out into space. So we do lose it on Earth. Eventually it goes out into space. But we know that we can use the heat. The wood itself is not useful for cooking but the heat energy is good for cooking. So we'll see all kinds of different variations on how heat is looked at. But again, the main thing to know here is that energy is not created nor destroyed in ordinary chemical changes. So what do we mean about ordinary? So notice that both the law of conservation of matter and the law of conservation of energy both state that this happens in ordinary chemical changes. These laws both state that we do not create or destroy matter or mass or energy. So how do we get from one thing to the other? Some of you may have heard of this famous equation, E equals mc squared. 
In that equation, the E stands for energy, the M stands for matter or mass, and the C squared is the speed of light squared. We're not going to worry about that portion. But in this statement, it says that we're converting energy into matter and matter into energy. But I just said you, can't com you cannot create or destroy matter or energy. It ends up that it, notice it says, in a ordinary chemical change. What is it not an ordinary chemical change is nuclear reactions. So nuclear chemistry is a whole different type of reaction. The inside of the sun is also a type of nuclear reaction. It is not an ordinary chemical change. So our sun is taking matter and turning it into energy, and it's being sent to us. In the sun, atoms are being smashed together and fused together in a process called fusion, and that gives off energy. On Earth, we do the opposite. We break those apart. The nucleus is broken apart in nuclear fission, which is what we see in nuclear power plants. So when we talk about the law of conservation of matter, the law of conservation of energy, we are not going to be using E equals MC squared. Those are reserved for things like the sun and nuclear power plants. When you go to live on the sun or work at a nuclear power plant, you'll find all those new rules. But for the rest of us, we're going to all follow the law of conservation of mass and the law of conservation of energy, where all of the reactions that we see will neither create or destroy matter or energy. Now let's see if you can decide which of the three laws is being described. Alrighty, so we have a you try it. So let's indicate whether each of the following describes the law of definite proportions, the law of conservation of mass, or the law of conservation of energy. Go ahead and pause the video while you try these, and then when you return, I'll answer the questions. Okay, so let's try these. So number one, liquid water, H2O liquid, is changed to steam, H2O gas, when water is boiled. In this case, we see that the formula H2O is the same as both a liquid and a gas, and that is because water will always have the same formula. So this is the law of definite proportions. Number two, when a fire burns, all of the sugar is turned into CO2, gas, and H2O, gas. In this case, we're looking at the law of conservation of mass because all of the sugar is turning into two new compounds for the total mass to stay the same. Number three, the percentage of carbon in carbon dioxide is 27.2%. Obviously, this is the law of definite proportions. Number four, chewing food. Hmm. That one's a little bit challenging because it could be a conservation of mass or the law of conservation of energy. But what we're really noticing is that they're taking the energy that is in food that we've already digested and we're putting it into the energy of motion. And that is telling us that this is the law of conservation of energy. We would not say it's the law of conservation of mass. While the mass is preserved, what we see is that we're not doing a chemical reaction, so we don't follow that rule. Since we're not changing from one chemical to another, but we are changing from one form of energy to another, so we say that's the law of conservation of energy. How about number five? We see here, the reaction below shows potassium oxide being produced, K2O solid, by combining oxygen, O2 gas, with potassium, K solid. The mass of potassium is 50 grams and the mass of the oxygen is 12 grams. The mass for the potassium oxide that was produced is 62 grams. And then it gives a formula, O2 gas plus potassium solid goes to K2O solid. So here we see the formulas and we see that those masses are the same. So this will definitely be the law of conservation of mass. And number six, if you mix 25 grams of sugar into 150 grams of water, the mixture weighs 175 grams. That is going to be the law of conservation of mass. By putting those two things together, we still have the same total mass. Number seven, rubbing your hands together to keep them warm. Here we're taking the energy of motion and friction and we're turning it into the energy of warmth, or heat. And so this is a law of conservation of energy. 
Number eight, beating on a drum. Here we're taking the energy of motion again. We're turning it into sound energy. This is the law of conservation of energy. And that leaves us with number nine, drum roll please. And that is the formula for ethanol drinking alcohol is C2H6O. Because we have a certain proportion and ratio of the carbon to hydrogen to oxygen, that tells us that this is the law of definite proportions. Hopefully you got those right and there'll be some more practice online.